and I will have a recording which is focused on the entrepreneurship here. Okay. Um, and uh, last time, I actually have a slide up to start on, but this version of PowerPoint, if you push push the button that normally starts it at that point, it goes back to the beginning. So um, I, I've gone through some comments on the draws of entrepreneurship, some of the major challenges, some of the pitfalls, some of the major failure modes, um, anti-patterns in this area. And I started to, to go through high level discussion of a set of specific spheres of, um, of, of concerns or, or needs or, um, or issues uh, within the entrepreneurship area. And I talked uh, a little bit about the, the business plan issues and, and some of the, the financial issues, talked about the uh, sort of the, the model of the company, whether it's aiming for large scale growth or not, whether it's an entrepreneurship form focused on the small scale or, or aspiring to grow very large and quickly. Um, whether it's uh, aiming to sell products or sell services. Um, so platforms would be another possibility um, that I kind of fold into to services, uh, who the target market is, um, whether you're aspiring to be a leading edge leader in the market, kind of a follower or a compliment or someone who, you know, a, a company that really um, secures its prosperity by, by helping to, to more fully fulfill solutions together with other market uh, market players, uh, whether it be Oracle and you build something that's atop of Oracle or or, or SaaS or PeopleWare or R or what have you. Um, and then you know I give reference to a couple of growth models, uh, uh, and uh, I noted in the semi customization side. Um, that, that actually forms a, a strategy. So, you know, if you look at software firms out there, um, there's a huge number of smaller firms that do custom contract delivery. Basically, they sell sometimes to a, a market segment, um, you know, the construction industry or agriculture or medical offices or, you know, legal firms or what have you. Um, they sell custom developed software or customized uh they customize existing platforms like uh you know like enterprise resource management platforms or what have you um but here you know you're being paid you deliver you deliver a system you get paid well for it maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars or something and you go off and you work for another client and you deliver for a couple hundred thousand dollars and you can do very well you know, the small number of partners can do extremely well. And there's quite a few uh, firms here in town. Um, ESDI is one down there in Spadina, for example, to make their bread and butter in this area. We sell a lot of pensions, uh, software solutions, et cetera, with document management, last I checked. Um, there's others that focus on semi-custom. And, and there, the difference is with custom, the customer owns the code often. Um, so if Zoo develops a website, yes. Uh, can you share the screen, the slides? Oh, oh, it's not shared online. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is great. Uh, and it may have meant that it not have been captured even um, in the recording. Not, not sure. But semi-custom would be firms which, so custom, Typically, you develop the system and the customer owns the resulting code base. Maybe it's in the public domain, but, but um, the intellectual property is basically delivered to the customer. They own it. They can have others continue the development. You've provided, you've provided that you know, development set of services, and they say thank you very much, and they own the code base. Um, Semi-custom commonly you as the as the business owns the companies you own the the intellectual property but you give a non 
a non-exclusive in perpetuity license to the customer to use their version of it however much they want to share it with others, et cetera. But you continue to own the code base. Now, why is that important? Can anyone tell me why would that be important that the, the firm developing it owns the code base? Why, why would you care if you were that software developer? Whether or not you own the code base. Yeah, Shed. Sorry? Security. Security would be a substantial one. That's right. Um, and uh, if you have continued ownership over the code base, um, you might uh, you might be able to deal with security risks and evolution of it much more easily. But there's another big reason. Uh, uh, yes. To retain, uh, to retain the client. Sorry? To retain the client. Yeah, so you can retain the client. You you have this copy, but often, and so you can continue to work with that client from then on. But often, it's intellectual property on the part of the the, the startup um, that they can then adapt for other clients. They deliver full value for each client. The client's happy; their needs have been met. They don't. The client doesn't really lose money if. Let's suppose you're delivering for a dental businesses and you you deliver a semi custom thing for a network of dental businesses in the Saskatoon area. They don't really lose any um, market share. They don't have any competitive concerns if you do the same thing in Winnipeg and you do the same thing in Edmonton and Regina. You're selling the same code base customized for them. You're making extensions to it over time that you can then resell. And so you're building up this asset, which you know allows you to deliver each successive solution more easily and with more value because you're building it up. And that's a very common model. Um, sometimes you see it with those uh, complementing existing systems, like like I mentioned, extending on top of platforms um, that exist. You know, selling value add solutions that that also um, that also retain this ownership and each new customer, they can deliver more and more value because they have a richer and richer solution and they extend it each time more and more. Very popular model, very uh, very favorable in terms of the work compared to the first of these because you don't have to go through and develop the system from scratch. You're, you've already got most of it delivered, you know, most of it built up. You're delivering the same value and you're delivering it faster. So, you know, the same, same type of solution, you're developing it faster and you're retaining that property. And so it's a lot less work than a custom custom shop. Um, it can't always be done in certain industries. Often the needs are just too disparate, but when it can be done, it's very favorable. Um, I've done quite a, quite a bit of work like that at the, in the entrepreneurship space. Um, Software as a service, uh, service delivery within this uh, this area is also very favorable. Uh, you know, you might have uh, cost per transaction charges uh, where you charge customers based on how much they actually use. Um, you know, they they become vested in your system. You you can roll out updates to the system online just about any time, etc. And a very popular model that for software as a service. Uh, uh, or, or for even desktop systems and so on as a subscription model. So there people pay per seat per year. And, and they are then able to use it as much as they want during that time. But subscription models, in general, if you look at industry beyond software, you know, subscription models have become very popular because they incentivize people to to make use heavy use of it and become um, become really um, uh, structure their operations around making use of it. Um, you see this in large stores like Costco, for example, where you know people buy a Costco membership and then they want to recoup value for their membership, right? They want to use it as much as possible and buy lots of things that are cheaper. And Costco gets lots of business. That is incentivized by the subscription model, um, and you know Microsoft has gone this way with Office 365 and uh, other other major vendors have often 
bought into the subscription idea. Um, and there's pre there's pricing strategies associated with this. Some of you may have heard of some of the, like the premium model. Anyone know what premium is? Yeah, Shed. Free to, you can free to download Yeah, so you get the minimal or the the smaller scale version of it for free, but you pay for the premium version, right? Or the pro version or whatever, however they call it, right? You pay for the extra, the extra features. You know, you you use YouTube for free, but you pay to not have ads, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Now some of us, you listening to YouTube, you know, some of us don't allow ads on our YouTube. We we just have thanks, we'll opt out. Yeah. Um, people appreciate it. I like to think, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so pricing strategies, there's a whole bunch of different pricing strategies. Some of these actually have really um interesting technical needs associated. How do you meter? How do you measure how much People actually using something that's a web application, for example, which has uh, offline support, or or you know has um, client side operations which don't require contact to back the server. How do you meter that? How do you charge them for that? For how much they're using it, so that if they don't use it much, they don't pay as much. If they use it more, they pay more. Um, how do you how do you give them a discount at first and then ramp it up, etc. Um, and there's all sorts of models here, you know, per seat license, where each year you have know, one person who can use it for the year for that price. Or you have, you know, one person at a time can use it. It doesn't matter if it's the same person, right? Um, it can be it can be different people. Or you charge per seat per year. So you actually charge on a per year basis. Um, uh, or you just have a you know per transaction um, charge that's very cheap for what have you. Um, many um, many different versions of this that have different incentives uh, in place. Um, some incentivize you to invest heavily in it, and some make you cautious about use. So if they're charging per transaction, maybe people say, well, we'll try to minimize how much we're using it. Because you get the more we use it, we charge more, we're charged more. But if people charge you per seat per year, if you're going to get that seat, you're going to use it really as heavily as you can, right? If you, you want to use it to its fullest extent. Um, and it to some degree it incentivizes uh, use, but maybe another similar competitor product is not per seat per year, it's just per seat. And you don't have to pay extra. Maybe you only charge for the upgrades. These are all questions that come up with software that are are interesting one and they have to be met by you know technical underpinnings. Um, volume pricing, you incentivize heavier use, but you charge very little for little use. Lots of fascinating stuff there that you know plays a role in like luring customers in, right? That's the whole premium model. You, you get lots of customers quick because it's free, but you try to make it sustainable by by getting them to buy into the pay scheme or the heaviest users, the one that kind of have wrapped their lives around it. Maybe then you start charging more over time, right? Um, early on, YouTube had um, had uh, you know limitations. For example, how much you could upload, the length of videos you could share, and I think you had to maybe pay for longer videos at one point, or you had to do something. I, I vaguely remember that from you know 10, 10 or so years ago, et cetera. Um, but maybe you all about it. Um, yeah, so uh, just bring a friend models, you know, where people can can recommend it to others and get rewarded themselves for it. If they bring someone else who, who subscribes or what have you, uh, you can charge for hardware, um, charge reduce rates for, for initial clients in certain areas. There's all sorts of, of, of interesting models there. Um, okay. Uh, so for a company seeking large scale growth, many of those apply fine, but um, but there's a set of issues that come in here in terms of company ownership that are really important. And I don't have time to do this justice. Um, 
just be aware that there's a set of stages companies go through that aspire for market growth, that aspire to grow in large ways. And you know, broadly, you have public ownership versus private ownership company. And companies generally start at private ownership. And here in Canada and the US, the terminology is a little bit different, but the distinctions are largely the same. You have sort of sole proprietorships where it's just like a person and a couple other people working around them who set up a business. You have partnerships um, in the US, you have C Corp and S Corps and so on. And, and here in Canada, there's a, a different set of terminology, but basically whether it's multiple partners or one sole proprietor, um, how much of a firm's infrastructure is around that. And you know, with, with private companies, which is typically where they start, you know, often the partners put in their own money or invest their own sweat equity. They work to, you know, uh, deliver product um, on their own time, et cetera. Sometimes they borrow from friends and family as part of it. Uh, and uh, you will often in these earlier stages start to think about attracting funding. So I know many, many companies that have gone through this successfully. Um, and you know, there's two really big sources that are commonly talked about at that stage, which are angel investors. These are investors that, well, they're investors. You know, they want to invest in companies. Often they have a personal stake in it and interest. They're at a smaller scale and they invest their own dollars. These are like family dollars. So there'll be someone who made it big in agriculture or made it big on in software or made it big in you know, and, and biotech or what have you. Now they have money built up for their family and they invest it carefully in startups. They kind of scout out and uh, and they invest it and they expect return on investment. Um, very common. Angel investors are often really, they care about the companies, they're interested in the stories, they get to know the founders and all that sort of stuff. I've dealt, dealt with them and they're an interesting crowd. Venture capitalists are much more a corporate institutional model, sometimes very predatory, um, but, but they bring much larger amounts of money to bear. Um, and I know people who have secured, you know, $30 million from them or $40 million for startups. Kind of uh, and uh, I know companies that have succeeded by virtue of this and companies that have failed where the VCs, um, you know, really ended up uh, pulling in their chips and so on. Um, and VCs are investing corporate dollars, not their personal money or family money or what have you, but corporate corporate monies. So they're they're the business model, right? This is model is invest and they take some of the equity. They take a share of that company. So the company is sold. Maybe the VCs get 20% of the of the earnings from that. Um, and they can do very well. If that company grows like gangbusters, the VCs, you know, monies derived from it can grow like gangbusters. Um, and you can get crowdfunding these days. This is a model that wasn't available earlier, but you know, there's a lot of issues there. I, I don't know that much about it, but um, it is attractive to some some parties to get to get started. Um, with larger companies, you have public ownership. It begins with something called an IPO, an initial public offering, where basically you float stock on the stock market and you get money from the stock market where people are investing in your corporation and you have shareholders who are basically co-owners of your company. And as with private ownership, there's different types of stock. There's what's called preferred stock, which gives you certain rights like voting. And then there's common stock. Um, and uh, preferred stock is generally preferred. It's, it's, uh, it gives you more rights within the framework. And when you start a company, you outline all these sort of things early on in the, um, in the articles of incorporation, but particularly in the company bylaws. You sort of outline, outline these things. Um, and there's ways to earn money for, for parties beyond this. Um, so, you know, in terms of ownership, many startups go under because of partner conflicts. They mentioned that earlier. Um, 
And I had emphasized earlier that the division of ownership, when I say equity, I mean ownership. Like when I say a 5% equity in the company, I mean I own 5%. And uh, and that should reflect the risk in a bit. We talked about that last time. Not not merely who contributed intellectually, but who has skin in the game? Who's actually at risk because they're sacrificing opportunities to work externally to work on this company, or they're taking extra risks? They're working three jobs, you know, to make sure this company succeeds or whatever. Um, I mentioned vesting. This idea that. Look, you may nominally be in line to earn 5%, but it only vests over time. So right now you might have 1%, but over time it grows. But maybe if you leave in less than three years, which is called a cliff, if I have a three-year cliff, if I leave in less than three years, I get nothing. All of that earnings that I had that going from 1%. 2% or take my way to 5%. Maybe I'll leave after two years. Didn't stay the full three years. All that's, I can't claim. So vesting is a common thing to keep people, to retain them. So they don't just go in and walk, right? Um, they don't just earn a little bit of the equity and, and leave to a, to a, a bigger firm. It keeps them for a long time. Um, and sometimes it can be milestone things. You vest. When your contributions have reached a certain point, like when you've delivered the first system, or when you know the first customer, you get the second customer in place, or what? Um, there's this issue of dilution, which is very common. So as companies grow, they want to hire people. They want to bring on partners. Maybe they want to bring on partners with a lot of experience in this area, former executives. My first company that I ran. We had, we're very fortunate to have our, our president, a former vice president at IBM, an IBM executive, and he came on board as our president. Fantastic president, I can't say. Um, way senior to me and my colleagues, but you know, he had just the right touch, could manage all the customers, uh, shield them from issues, shield them from customer complaints, shield them from you know, uncertainties and could facilitate things. His job, he said, was to clear the way and facilitate, coordinate, and, you know, deal with, with conflicts, et cetera. Great guy. Um, later became head of the MIT Entrepreneurship Club and uh, is a very prominent figure in the entrepreneurship world. He's right, right now because he's, you know, he's chaired three or four successful companies. Dilution, though, is one of the things that often goes around with this. You, you want to hire someone by offering them equity. Well, but what about the people that have already been offered equity? Well, often their components of the company get diluted because you issue more shares to so get them out. And so people who contributed early on and no longer are part of it, it's a big risk for companies. You know, they contribute early on and they leave. If they expect they have 5% now and will forever stay 5%, they're likely to be disappointed because typically they take that. Um, there can be th contingencies in the ownership, you know, like it's contingent on you delivering or on you delivering satisfactorily or on you bringing on, you know, the second client or what have you. Um, uh, within a large, a lot of companies, they have what are called stock ops, which used to be for a larger, typically publicly owned company. If you come on board a fast growing company um, and um, you know, you'll also be given a, what's called a stock option. The stock option basically um, is something that you can exercise after a certain amount of time, typically with the company. So it has some vesting or some, some, some time, a cliff associated with it. Once you're there for a couple of years, that stock option has ownership, There's, it is equity, it is ownership in the company of a certain amount. So maybe you get 1% of the companies. But if you get 1% of the shares of the company at the price that obtained when you got hired. So if you got hired five years ago, you're 1% of that, got hired five years ago, 
and the stock has gone way up since that point, you have a pretty darn good deal, you know, because now the stock is way higher than it was then. You could buy the stock now up to 1%, you know, uh, at the price that it was when you got higher. This is very common. And it incentivizes the customer or the um, the workers, the, the software developers or what have you, to really work for the company because they want to see the stock value rise, right? And their equity, their ownership, their stock option could be worth a lot more. So a uh, very common scheme for uh, for these medium-sized software startups. Um, and one which I know people have done very, very very well. Um, okay. Um, and there can be transfer constraints to who you can give stock options to, et cetera. Like if I own a fraction of a company, often there's limits to like, I can't just give it to anyone. Yeah, for instance. So are the stock options usually at a, at a stock option? So when you say out of money, you have to help me understand this one. Oh, out of the money, like the stock option is higher than the price. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, um, the issue is that you have the option, that's why it's called an option, to buy it at the price when it came on. If the stock now is lower than the price, you're obviously not going to be attracted to that because you can buy the market for now, you know, for cheaper. But most commonly for growing startups, the stock price has gone up some. And often what happens is, and I know this, that um, the stock is repriced, right? So along the way, it's repriced because there's a issuing of more stock. And what was, you know, one share before becomes 10 shares or what have you. And, and that's all part of this, um, of this scheme. And you know, you're generally therefore incented because what you could have bought then would be maybe a larger amount of stock now for that's worth, you know, as a whole, comparatively a lot more. Hopefully you got okay. So so you've gotten a monetary gain, even if there's more stock that's been issued. Um okay, so um yeah. So uh, venture capital, I mentioned this. The idea here is, look, they give you money in return for percentage money, right? Sometimes it's managerial control. Sometimes they say, okay, we'll give you uh, $500,000. We want to put in place, you know, a um, someone who's going to serve as the chief executive of your company. That's the deal. And, you know, sometimes the company goes for it and sometimes it doesn't. Or we'll give you $5 million as long as you keep your executive um, structure. We'll give you a marketing manager, we'll give you a head of sales, and we'll give you a chief operating officer. Package deal. Do you do it or not? $5 million comes with it. Um, they want to have confidence that you can deliver. Um, so, you know, companies. Uh, in this business, can read small firms well. They can kind of get a sense of their of their uh, weaknesses and strengths. And often they they will have some requirements that come along with the money beyond equity. But equity is the most foundational. They want you know forty percent of the company for five million dollars. Um, they'll give you that five million. Um, sometimes they give you um, money. That is on. There's a technical term for it that's escaping me right now, but it's on loan for now. But it can be converted into equity if they're satisfied. So right now, it's a loan you take on at zero interest, and uh, but they get a certain um, a certain return in terms of ownership of the company. I think. Uh, but then, uh, if it if they deem fit, it can be converted over to a broader amount of ownership or something. I'm forgetting the details of it, but there's a there's a term for that where basically it's convertible. Um, so venture capital is highly sought after. Um, 
a lot of people go to venture capital firms and they're big areas of huge capital um capital investment in this uh san francisco bay area is, is famous for this you know firms that that serve tech clients uh boston area is another big one new york is another big one these, these uh firms that that invest in technology um and uh they know the market well often they're sometimes predatory um they often take a really hard look at the business plan and challenge you challenge you on your business plan um and uh there's you know sometimes they they do insist on you taking on certain people um there's a subset of these that are called vulture capitalists that deal with companies that are in profit that are in trouble and the company's in trouble and they'll swoop in and say look we can bail you out we'll loan you four hundred thousand dollars but we get we'll dictate the terms um and you know it's a uh it's a tough deal um so vcs value firms in different ways they got to value the firm when they're offering you money for equity right they're not going to offer you 500k for 50 percent equity unless they feel your firm is worth it you know um they need to feel your firm is worth at least a million dollars for that to be you know not crazy right um uh if maybe they feel your firm is really worth four million dollars and therefore 50 percent loaning you 500k for 50 percent half the company stock is really good deal and often they're looking for that sort of gain uh some look at really fundamentals about the company like who's competing with you what uh you know what's the market share how much will it bear what's the size of the market into which you can grow etc what are the barriers um what sort of secure property intellectual property are you building up others do kind of a generic assessment um so this is fundamentals and this is kind of a more generic uh type of uh of assessment that's less based on the detail um so these are a couple of red flags that come in with investors a company a small startup that is not a clear business focus or business plan Maybe there's a lack of a massive scalable business model. They're not going to invest in a small consulting startup that's just looking to do local business. They're going to they want to invest in something that's real big. You know, the Twitters, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Oracles of the world. Um, and uh, they're going to be looking for business models that scales, that grows, that's viable. Um, Instagram, Snapchat, or whatever um uh they also look for partner issues so i i've dealt with vcs at, at different points and um i remember one red flag one of my first dealings with vcs was uh we had a partner who had who'd been one of the founders but he left the firm he left the firm after six months or something like that um good terms he had contributed a huge amount early on but he still owned something like 20% of the company, which is comparable to what I own. Uh, and he went back to grad school. We're trying to get that involved. Um, right now. And um, he really wasn't involved at all in the company. You know, you kind of ask every once in a while how things are going and what's um what the host how is the system evolved and all that sort of stuff but he wasn't really involved until guess what until we started to get inquiries about buying us out and you know the numbers were in the millions and so he started to know you know oh, this sounds pretty good so he would show up unsolicited you know meetings um let's say i'm one of the founders um glad to meet you yeah. <laughs> the folks in the VC companies who are thinking about buying us, or, or folks from the um, actually it was it was another firm that was thinking about acquiring us, where I remember this most directly. And he basically started to insert, he came out of the woodwork to insert himself into the discussion. This was not an isolated case. I knew another company where where the similar thing happened. That there was someone who was thinking about buying them or or investing in them. 
And you know, these old partners come out and say, I'm one of the I'm one of the uh, the key people here. And you know, um this is what we need to uh, to make the deal work. And, and it's like I haven't seen you for a year. And and you start saying, you know, what your demands are for the uh, for the purchaser that does not endear yourself to the other members of the company. Um and and they they have their eyes up for that. So his appearance. And the dispute about it made them basically said, okay, they have skeletons in the closet. We're not going to get involved in this. It's too messy. We don't want to get you know tied up in, in, in partner problems, basically. A, a company that has partner problems is not a good place. Um, they're also going to look for high equity shares of people who are not full-time contributors. Um, look, you know, as a full-time professor, I can own five percent of the company. That I co maybe on 10%. But anything about 10% is going to scare them. Because they're going to say, oh, come on. You're saying, if you're saying this guy teaches these classes and is doing research and, you know, gets a con to the health system for, for 13 months to direct modeling, you're saying that he's a big partner in your company? You got to be um, so they'll tolerate, you know, a small fraction of equity for someone who's not full time. But if someone's full time, that's the sign they've skin in the game. They're, you know, they're really in this. They're really pulling for it. Otherwise, how do they know they're going to, you know, really contribute? Um, so, um, you know, they'll also be spotting if, if the company doesn't have secure intellectual property, if it doesn't have a barrier to entry, if if people. If, if the current people who are in the company left, if that would destroy the company's possibilities, there's no secure code base that exists, you know, still, there's no, there's no core intellectual property, that's a sign of a weakness as far as that comes out, because it's just the people and people can leave. Yeah. So, uh, you were talking about your department, co-founder, and I'm yeah. wondering, like, uh, how do you deal with the situation of company? I'll tell you how you do it. Um, so what you have is written agreement, and um, and it's it's awkward early on because you say, "Oh, great, we're all friends. We're going to start this company. We're going to do great things together, and it's our dream." And, and gosh, aren't lawyers expensive? You know, like oh, we can't go to a lawyer and pay thousands of dollars. We could invest in, you know, we could we could do a couple more months of development for that amount of money or what have you. And often firms uh, at this stage all pray not putting things in right and not putting difficult things in right, like conflict resolution plans and and wording that deals with these issues. But you can um, in corporate bylaws. So articles of incorporation are named for external parties. This is like what's formally on file, you know, in in governmental records about the company. Corporate bylaws are the internal documents, and they often include exactly dealing with these sorts of issues, the partner issues. Um, and it needs to lay it out in impersonal ways that are quite clear legally, you know, what the expectations are. And if someone leaves the company, is not contributing at least X amount for Y amount of time, you know, they, uh, they you know, they must, uh, that their shares are considered a burden to the company, or they don't earn those shares for a certain amount of time. They have to put in place wording and contingency clauses, meaning like conditional clauses if this happens, we'll do this, otherwise that. And these corporate bylaws are highly crafted documents. It's like an algorithm. If anyone's interested in corporate bylaws, you know, we have a great set that were created by uh, by lawyers for one of our companies. And, and they're really um, tuned to try to head off these sort of issues. To try to head off these issues of people not Pulling, pulling their weight and leading to awkward situations because they anticipate awkward situations. They anticipate, I mean, you don't like to talk about these things, but how if a partner dies? How if a partner becomes incapacitated? What if a partner 
um, gets divorced or something? Um, what if uh, uh, what if you know the firm gets bought? You want to be able to anticipate these different eventualities in the wording, and you don't want to reinvent the flat tire or the the square wheel, right? The goal is not for you to write these from scratch. The goal is to model them on workable corporate bylaws that have work in the tech venture space. And there's good ones. They're really good ones. And the best lawyers in this space, and I know some top quality lawyers, they, you know, they have this down path to head off, to have clauses that will deal with these sort of circumstances. And the point is you need it in writing and you need to take it seriously. Just because we're all technical folks, it's easy to say that legal mumbo jumbo doesn't matter, you know, it's it's all a bunch of lawyer who hum. But no, it actually really matters. And for these, when you have these awkward situations, is when it matters because it's in writing and it's impersonal, right? It's the rules of the company. It's not about he did this and it's his fault, and you know, it's you know, he against her or what have you. It's it, it's it's all something that's written down. So um, you know you have these contingency clauses associated with some of these bylaws that lay out things. And it can't be perfect, but it's it'll head off a lot of problems. And then you have conflict resolution documents. Um, so these are documents that set out a clear path to prompt identification and settlement of disputes. If there's a dispute, it has a clear path to go. It's not left to like, oh, there's all these disputes, we don't know what to do, you know. Um, it's not all ad hoc. You have a clear set of rules for it. And, um, you know, you, you try to identify these things early and, 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 and institute this sort of process to, um, to deal with conflict. And I mentioned these last time, you know, you have different levels of meeting. Often you insist on on a meeting in person or maybe multiple meetings. Um, then you have mediation, which is non-binding attempts to bring parties to a common ground and, and identify a joint settlement, a, a, you know, a, a compromise. Or you have arbitration, which is binding. And only at that level does it go to litigation, which is basically take the court. You want to avoid it getting here. You want to you want to make sure there's as much um, uh, as much guarantee that it will stay at a low level, or a level of, of discussion and and maybe uh, mediation. Um, okay, uh, you know we're we've gone over time here. Um, I I think I just I'll end with a couple of things. So we're here together. There's actually quite a good tech ecosystem. Maybe you folks know it, maybe you don't. Um, a lot of, a lot of neat tech firms um, right here, and you know others all across Canada. Uh, Montreal is a big hub for AI. Um, Toronto is tremendous amount in the financial services area. Um, BC and Vancouver, in particular, has a thriving tech area as well. Um, but Saskatoon is actually quite a, a good tech marketplace. There's some fairly big firms here, um, whether it's uh, firms with, with hardware ties, um, so some of what Saskel does, Exima does, uh, et cetera, um, uh, Solito does, get into sort of the, the hardware side of things. But there's also uh, firms that that deal with, you know, industry vertical segments like Yardi for, um, real estate software over many years when it was point two. Um, uh, Vendasta for online online systems uh, involving, I think, buying and selling, kind of the, the evolution of walk ads, et cetera. Um, there's a lot going on, a lot of small startups. Some might come from some of my students, quite a few of my students. Um, we took this very class years ago on a, on a startup. Some of them very successful. Um, and uh, just be aware there's there's a lot of people around looking looking for partners on the student side. Um, and uh, you should be aware there's some great opportunities there. There's some risks there too. Um, 
one thing you really want to out for is anyone who approaches you who who has the conception that the real value lies in their idea of a product or business. Now, I don't want to less than that. It's a great idea for business models, and services, and products. That's great stuff. But the truth is, the most substantive value is in the doing, not in the saying or the envision. It's not talking the talk, walking the walk. And um, there's there's a brand of these folks who are not technical themselves, and they see technical folks as the key to making a big buck. And they see themselves as having the golden key, the idea, and you as the route to success, as the route to delivery of that. And fundamentally, they don't see it so much as a partnership as you doing what they want you to do to fulfill their dream, and you're just a step towards that. You don't. You want to be very cautious about that because the real value often comes in only when your ideas and technical abilities is combined with those ideas. Without you, they cannot deliver. Without their ideas, maybe you wouldn't go as far, but you could still do well. Um, so just be aware that this is a danger. And I've encountered these folks many times. Um, my secretary knows them quite well. One of them she knows is Captain Obvious. Uh, and he sort of comes, comes prowling for students sometimes because um, he wants to work with students to realize his dream vision. Um, and they can be predatory. Um, uh, they can try to butter up students. They can try to lure them to, to sort of work for them. And without really investing in the students as partners. Um, business is great. I love entrepreneurship. I think it's, it's an absolutely fascinating and worthy area, but just be aware that there's a class of folks out there who don't fully value the tech side and think the tech side is just a bunch of, you know, sort of in the lead stuff and the real value is this yet. Um, you should be clear if you're approached, are you being solicited as a founder? as a partner or as just someone delivering as a salaried employee or just as a contractor? Like, do they want to hire you and pay you a salary? Is that what they're suggesting? Or are they suggesting, you know, finding a company? You know, when you get a good share uh, for full-time involvement, um, are they seeking you to be an ongoing partner in an existing firm? I mean, what exactly are they after? You want to be clear about this, and, and you don't want to leave it till you know well into the discussion. You want to get an understanding of what they're what they're looking for, what they're seeking to get out of you, um, what's your role that they see in them, and what could your role be? Because there may be great people to work with as a founder, but if you work with them as a contract employee, you don't get any share, right? They pay you. They say, okay, look, I'll pay you uh, seventy-five dollars an hour. You work hundreds of hours for me, and then I own the intellectual property and you're done, thanks, you know, um, thanks for your delivery, um, and they own the intellectual property, and you go off. Um, you want to be cautious about that. So you're worth a lot more. Um, uh, you know, and, and the hiring party often wants to start love commitment and escalate. Um, in other words, they, they don't want to start with big promises to you. How do they know they know you can do it, right? A lot of the deal with, with making negotiation. They have risks that they're worried about. You have risks you're worried about. You want to come to common uh, a common ground. One way to do that is to have these things called contingency calls. And these this is basically what up front. Okay, I know. I know you need to know I can deliver on this. But if I deliver, we agree this. Okay? You're confident you can deliver. If, if you deliver, they'll be happy and yeah, sure, they'll invest in you. So I want to put a contingency clause in there that anticipates that, right? Um, it shields them from the risk because you're they're not promising make, you know, make you a partner or if you uh, um, a permanent job or whatever it is uh, as a salaried employee up front, but 
if you deliver at a level there that meets their expectations or meets the agreement, then um, then you'll um, you'll be uh, you'll be treated at that level. You get that agreement up front. So those negotiations. I used to teach negotiation as a bit of this course. I had a module on negotiation. So really interesting. Um, you have preferences, they have preferences. You have risk exposures, they have risk exposures. And you can identify these win-wins in really clever ways by trading things off that you care about more than they care about, or they care about more than you care about, or where you're risk averse or they're risk averse. You're confident, they're risk, they think it's risky. And you can do great things to identify win-wins. Um, so, you know, you want to ask, uh, are you being hired into a company where there's a set of parties working together and they're sort of the odd person out? Um, um, does the founder really understand the importance, the, uh, the texture of software development? Do they understand how much intellectual contribution you're making there? That you're not merely, you know, doing what they told you to do? Um, and uh, you want to be careful about you know, uh, founders who, who people who fancy themselves software company founders and are into flash and so on, but don't really understand what it means to deliver uh, in this area. They like the idea of being a software entrepreneur, but they don't know the reality. And again, I've had students in this class taken out for drinks by some of these folks to try to lure them into, you know, longer term work. In company, if you will. Um, and if you ask me what if you're being solicited, um, what real asset are they bringing to the table? Like, okay, if you work with them and you spend a large part of your time over the next six months or something working for them, you know, in what capacity, where is this going? What what is the guarantees involved, contingency clauses? And ask what real asset are they bringing to the table? Okay, so they have an idea, but are they bringing financial resources? Are they bringing networks of investors or collaborators or customers that they have on call that would help the product go, you know, um, sell, sell well. Um, you know, is the firm that they're supposedly representing that's interested in you, is it already incorporated? Is it formally recognized or is this just an idea in their mind right now? You often they sort of hide these things and, and it's kind of vague, but it behooves you to, to figure out, you know, like what's the stage at which they're they're located, um, and you know, are they working full time on it, or or is it just um, is it just something that Sid um, that is um, uh, is is sort of a part time gig for them that they're just exploring? Um, so that's what you want to find out. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we're over time here. If you're asked to sign a contract, I wish I'd known this at your age. If you're asked to sign a contract, make sure it says who is agreeing what with whom. A contract has to mention which party is making this contract with which party. Don't go for a contract that says you will be paid. You know, uh, we will be paid $12,000 upon delivery of this system. Because guess what it leaves out? Who will pay? <laughs> and so Lee delivers the system and he discovers the $12,000 is not paid to him. And you go to the person with the contract and they said, well, this, believe me, I've done that. Uh, you know, th this contract was for the company that doesn't exist, so you're not owed any money. They said, but wait, you, 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 know, you said, that I'd be paid. And they say, well, you know, that was the company that was going to pay you, but um, there's no company, so there's no payment. Yeah, but I delivered. Yeah, well, it's too bad. Um, yeah, don't, don't do that. So, home, which legal party is agreeing with which legal party? What? What exactly is being promised? Um, what is the time horizon for this? You know, who owns the resulting property? You know, are, are they going to take it? Thank you very much. And I'm done with you um, after those $12,000. Um, what risks are there here? You know, who's bearing? Um, what contingency clauses are needed to deal with unexpected things that happen or, or different possibilities? What are the dispute resolution terms? And, and is it enforceable? 
Um, if you if you have someone in your family who knows anything on the legal side, often they can look at a contract. Maybe they're just a savvy business person and say, that doesn't look enforceable. I mean, um, there are some, um, you know, there's some red flags that can occur in these things that make make it clear that they're they're kind of way too informal. Um, okay. Um, so I've mentioned risk. Contingency clauses are great thing. Contingency clauses help you cut through risk uh, hesitancy on both parties, and they can lead to win wins. Um, I wish I could continue on this. Um, there's all sorts of great stuff um, that I'd love to talk about. But I need to switch to the other component of this in about four minutes. Um, so uh, I'm going to stop this. Again, if anyone wants me to talk more about the entrepreneurship side, I'm, I'm glad to do it. I can record a set of lectures and, uh, and deliver 